most frequently used in speaking about other religious traditions was anathema. They are condemned. And now you say that the role of the church is to recognize, preserve, and promote their religious values. The, the passage that is most frequently uh, excerpted from this document is uh, the church, uh, I don't have my copy with me right now, Uh, well, it's, it's that the church recognizes the array of truth and, and accepts what is good and true in every religion. Okay? Uh, that still uh, leads to the question of who decides? <laughs> who decides what's good and true? And I think Francis, Pope Francis, answer that would be that's not an intellectual exercise. Look to the fruits. Look at the fruits. That's, that's how you decide what's good and true. That's pure gospel teaching. A bad tree doesn't bear good fruit, and a good tree doesn't bear bad fruit. So if, if the fruits are good, then what gives rise to them must be good and good. That, that dimension of it. But, but those three words, recognize, preserve, and promote. Uh, that, that, if you want, I don't know, you may have heard this in some of the other presentations that have been made on the Vatican documents, or will in the future. Uh, there's a, a twofold way of approaching these documents. One is to approach them in terms of continuity with all that came before, and another approach is to speak about the discontinuity. Now, in, there's no doubt there is continuity in many of these documents with teaching that has been there from the beginning and developed over centuries, but there's also discontinuity. And, and in this document, it's like the church says, Change horse. <laughs> and we're no longer, our first word about other religious traditions is not going to be, they are wrong. But our first word should be, what can we learn from them? What answers are they trying to give to these fundamental human questions? And, you know, I, I, I'm always sort of in, fascinated by the thought that ultimate questions are very much related to geography, the kind of world in which you grew up. Uh, now, if you, if you grow up in, or a culture grows up in India, lush for the most part, plentiful food, you know, uh, trees bearing fruit, grains, I mean, uh, that's, you know, survival is not going to be much of a question. But if you grow up in a desert environment, you, you'll have other questions about the meaning of human life, what you, what you need to survive. So the, the response to these fundamental human questions is different. And, and that's what makes for this religious diversity. Uh, there are people who find, would say yes, but. You know, and we maybe get into some of those yes, but questions afterwards. Uh, is there no room for discernment? Can you say, uh, a Mayan religion which uh, not only accepts but even just takes for granted human sacrifice, is that to be put on an equal footing with a, a Buddhist attempt to end suffering? You know? Well, you, you, you can't say that, but you, you again have to go back to why. Why are they doing that? Where did that come from? That has to be the first question. So it doesn't mean a kind of, well, whatever, you know, anything goes, uh, as long as it's sincere, that's all that counts. I don't think that's an adequate answer either. But certainly an adequate answer, or at least the first adequate answer, is not to say we're right and they're wrong. Um, let me just end with a little story. I heard this somewhere about uh, a man on a bridge who looks like he's going to jump off, and somebody comes up and says, stop, 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 stop. stop. Can, I, can I just talk to you a little bit you know, before? You do what you're planning to do. He said, I, I just want to know, uh, would you say you're a theist or an atheist? And he says, well, I'm a theist. I believe in God. Oh, wonderful. He said, so do I, so do I. Um, now, do you believe um, in, in one God or many gods? Well, I, 
believe in one God. Yeah, so am I, so am I. He says, monotheist. Very, very good, very good. Now, monotheist, um, do you believe in the one God, who is the Father of Jesus Christ, or is your God just a spirit in the heavens? No, I believe in the one God, who is the Father of Jesus. Oh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. He said, now, would you say you're a follower of Jesus Christ? Well, yeah, I guess I am. Well, are you um, part of the great Western tradition of Christianity or the Eastern tradition of Christianity? He says, well, I'm one of the Western tradition. And, oh, wonderful. He said, so am I. Now, are you a part of the Catholic Western tradition or the Protestant Western tradition? He says, well, I Wonderful, he said, so and so, so. Now, are you Protestant evangelical or Protestant reformed? Well, reformed. So am I, so am I. Now, Protestant reformed, are you more uh, Methodist or Baptist? Well, Baptist, yes. A Baptist, uh, Southern Baptist <laughs> or American Baptist? Well, I guess I'm more American. I am too, he says. Um, Upper Michigan Baptist or Lower, Lower Michigan. He says, I'm Lower Michigan Baptist. You heretic, he says, and throws off. <laughs> sign up to be part of the state church. So that question goes on. But after his uh, death in 1958 and the election of John the XXIII, uh, who, when he was apostolic nuncio, that is the ambassador of the Vatican in Bulgaria, was responsible for the saving of many Jews, uh, getting them out of the country. When he was elected, some prominent Jewish leaders came to him and said, uh, Your Holiness, the Catholic Church has to do something about the way it regards the Jewish people. Because the anti-Semitic tone, at least, of so much of traditional church teaching uh, is anti-Jewish. Uh, and especially the, the term that the Jews were guilty of deicide, killing God. You know, that was, that was common. That was very common. Or, or the Jews have, uh, are a cursed nation. Right back again to the curse. Because they call down upon themselves, uh, you know, uh, the, the curse of God. You know, let his blood be upon us and our children. 
you know, when, when they called for the, the Jewish leaders had this. There may have been common people among them as well, but when the Jewish leaders, uh, the priests and some of the Pharisees were calling for Jesus' death because they said he is a blasphemer. He, he makes himself equal to God. And, you know, the cry was, may his blood be upon us and our children. So part of the Catholic teaching, and it was never official, but it was common, was that the Jews are God killers and the Jews are cursed because of what they've done. And this prominent Jewish leader, uh, I don't have his name right, that's right now, uh, said to John the 23rd, you've got to do something about that. And John the 23rd, on his own initiative, changed the Good Friday prayer. Uh, and uh, the Good Friday prayer, you know all those prayers on Good Friday, that's all kind of a long list of intercessions, you know. And when it came to the Jews, it said, let us now play, pray for the perfidious Jews. And John the 23rd on his own initiative just scratched that out. Um, so then when, when John the 23rd in, I think it was 1959, maybe 1960, said he was going to call an ecumenical council, a full council of all the church, uh, these Jewish leaders again said, this council has to make a statement. And you know, they were well, absolutely traumatized by what happened during the Third Reich, when, what, six million Jews were, were put to death. Um, and, and they said, you know, the church bears some responsibility for this. Not that it officially approved of what the Nazis were doing, but because it's long tradition of anti-Semitism being against the Jewish people uh, for being God killers and cursed by God, it created a mentality that allowed something like the Holocaust to take place. Yeah. Uh, this is not to say that there are Catholics who approved of the Holocaust. In fact, there are many who openly rejected it. You know, yeah stood against it and paid often with their lives. You know, recently, uh, the beatification of a Polish couple, and there's five, five or six children who were shot, one, one still in the womb, who were shot by the Nazis for protecting, uh, sheltering a Jewish family in their home. So, th there were such cases. You know, not nearly enough. It should have been universal. It wasn't universal. <clears throat> So the, the decision was made that the Vatican Council would put out a decree, a statement, um, what should I say, lamenting or asking pardon for its way, the way it was complicit, maybe unconsciously and unwillingly, in the Holocaust. When that news got out, uh, bishops in primarily Muslim countries, mostly in the Mideast, said if that statement comes out, the Muslims will regard it as a pro-Israeli statement. You remember, Israel had become a nation in 1948, so just a decade and a few years later. And it was still not recognized, including by the Vatican and many other nations, as a state. And they said if the Vatican comes out with a statement that reverses its position on the Jewish people, officially, um, I, I no longer blaming the whole people for the death of Christ. The, the nations of the Mideast that are predominantly Muslim, but which have significant Christian and Catholic uh, citizens, will uh, regard this as a pro-Israeli a statement on, the, on behalf of the state of Israel, and this will be disastrous for the Christian communities in this country, because they will begin, if not persecuting, at least discriminating against them. So there was a back and forth, it went back and forth. And finally, and the history is very long and complicated, all of not in many years, from basically 62 to 65, numerous drafts of this document were made uh, trying to address some of these issues, trying to speak of the church's relation to Jews, not in terms of nationality, but in terms of religion, 
uh, culture. And a compromise was finally reached by saying, let's make this a statement about the church's relationship to other religions and include the question of the Jewish relationship to the people of Israel, to the Jewish people, the church's relationship to the Jewish people, in that statement. So it will not be just a statement on the church's relation to Jews, but to religions of other uh, stripes. And so that's what we have here. We have a document which begins by talking about uh, the relationship with all people, the common humanity we share, uh, the fact that as belonging together, uh, we are all brothers and sisters, we have fundamental questions uh, about the meaning of life, about ultimate truth, about ultimate reality, and the fact that the response to that, those questions is different. That's the beginning. Then it talks about the great religious traditions of uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Islam. And then the second half of the document is all about the church's relation to the Jews. And it, it's much more extensive, um, but it's in some ways also very general. If you notice the final paragraph of the document, number five, basically gets back to a more universal question. So, uh, we cannot call on God the Father of all if we refuse to treat in a brotherly way any human being created as they are in the image of God. The human relation to God the Father and his relation to um, all people are so linked together that scripture says he who does not love does not know God. So it ends on a more general note. Um, but it's also interesting to notice that this document does not say anything about deism. That had become such a neuralgic term, you know, that it just avoided that. It didn't say. But it does say, it's, you cannot say that all Jewish people since the time of Christ are responsible for the death of Christ. That, that is absolutely not to be said. Nor does it include the, the word condemn. And, and there were Jewish leaders who, who saw that as a sign that the church was still giving in to those who felt that, well, the Jewish people are cursed, you know, and, and so did not use the word condemn. And there were Jews who were disappointed with that, while recognizing that this is still a significant change, and that any mention of anti-Semitism in any way in church teaching or preaching is simply out of order. The big question it does not deal with and, and that's a question that is still being reserved. Uh, do Jews need to be converted, need to believe in Jesus Christ as the Messiah and Son of God to be, as we put it, saved? Or is, are they still the recipients of the covenant God made with the chosen people and they can remain faithful to that and therefore, we should stop any attempt to evangelize and call Jews to conversion. That's still open. It's moving more in the direction, I would say. But it's still being discussed and debated. Is it because they are the recipients of the covenant God freely made with the descendants of Abraham? That is, their, if you want to use such a colloquial term, their ticket to heaven. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I find it very interesting. I, I mentioned already the prayers of Good Friday. Uh, oh, dang it, that's in my uh, uh, computer. It didn't get on my printed version. Uh, but if you, if you were just to look at the, the prayer that is now used on Good Friday, uh, there is no mention of uh, earlier prayers said that God may remove the blindness of their hearts so that they may accept Jesus as the promised Messiah. That's not there anymore. It's just, may God keep them faithful to the covenant he has made with them. That's, you know, not, and there, that's that whole thing, I don't know if you've ever heard the expression, pardon me if I say it in Latin, lex orandi, lex credendi, the way you pray is, uh, determines the what you believe. So, the way we pray determines what we believe. And if we are praying that God removes the blindness 
that has enshrouded the Jewish people and leads them to faith in Jesus as the Messiah, well, that's what we're going to believe. But now if we're praying every Good Friday, may God grant that they remain faithful to the covenant that has made with them. And then quote St. Paul saying, God does not uh, go back on his promise. That, you read that in Paul's letter to the Romans when he deals with the Jews. God does not go back on his promise. That promise is still holds and is still valid. But I'm saying this is still an open question. This is still an open question. The other open questions that remain, not with regard to this passage on the Jewish people, but on other religions is, um, so let's just say interreligious relations, we now talk about interreligious dialogue. Yeah. Uh, being in relation with people of other religions. Does this now take the place of what we would call evangelization? Evangelization, preaching the gospel you know, to other people, calling them to be believers in Jesus Christ, calling them to conversion. Is that all gone now? That's what some people think. And now we're all in this kind of wishy-wishy, well, everybody's fine just as you are, you know. Uh, um, you know, we, we respect your you for what you believe. We're not asking you to believe the way we believe. That, 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 this document opens that question. If the document says we are to recognize, preserve, and promote the good things of other religions, does that mean we can't still ask them, invite them, to become disciples of Jesus Christ. Pope Francis deals with that very specifically, and his point is, evangelization is not proselytism. Proselytism is, you know, you're punching them in the face and saying, you better believe or not. I, I remember again another story. This is an American who was teaching in Iran, and he said on one of his flights back to the United States, he uh, was reading a book, and the person next to him saw that it was a book, I don't know, something spiritual. And he said, he asked him, are you a, a, I don't know, a believer or something like that? And he said, yes, I am. He said, um, <clears throat> Christian? And he said, no, in fact, I'm Muslim. And the guy said, oh, that's too bad. <laughs> and he says, why? And he says, well, you're going to hell. <laughs> so what? And he said, and, and so this Muslim said, well, well, why is that? Why am I going to hell for being a Muslim? He said, because you don't believe in Jesus. He said, well, yes, I do. <laughs> Jesus is a prophet. I believe in Jesus. And he says, well, you don't believe Jesus is your savior. And he said, yes, I do. Because the Muslims believe that in the last judgment, Jesus will come to save. And uh, he said, well, you don't believe in Jesus, that Jesus is a savior the way I do. <laughs> and therefore you're going to hell. <laughs> and that, that can be so much a part of it. Now, evangelization is not prof, uh, proselytizing, you know, arguing. You know, you're wrong, I'm right, and I'm going to prove to you why you're wrong, and I'm right. Francis says, evangelization is witness. Evangelization is witness. What, what will call people to accept Jesus as the, as I like to put it, the human face of God, or the, the body language of God, that's a term I love. Jesus is God's body language. If, if you are going to believe in Jesus as God's self-revelation with a human face, and believe in what Jesus says constitutes being a follower is, loving God with all your heart and all your mind, loving your neighbor as yourself. What's going to convince people of that is the way you live. Not, not what you say. And if they're going to see something about your way of life that they find admirable, uh, in, you know, convincing, then they're going to be willing to investigate what, what makes that person that way. So, and I love the passage in, in Paul's letter, or uh, Peter's letter, um, 1 Peter chapter 3, 15, 16. In your hearts, sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. And what, what Paul seems to be saying 
if somebody's going to ask you, why are you doing this? You know? And if, then, then that's the opening for you to explain, I'm doing this because I believe in Jesus Christ, I believe in him as God's son on earth, the human face of God, and I believe in his gospel. That's why I, that's why I'm doing it. You know, it's not because I, you know, and I, I fail. I'm, I don't do it all the time. Uh, you remember the first interview with Pope Francis? Pope Francis was asked by this journalist, "Who is Orgay Bergoglio?" And he said, "A sinner." That was the first answer he gave. And he said, "I'm not just saying this to make an affair. This is true. I am a sinner." Uh, you know, so if, if people see something about our way of life, uh, the way we carry ourselves, the way we interact with other people, the kind, the good work we might be doing, uh, you know, the volunteering, I, you know, where is the way we raise our kids, um, the way our kids respond to us, they're, if, they, if they're curious about that, and uh, then you have a chance. That, that's your opening. That's when you can start. Doing this speaking, but if you just come on and say you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, I'm right, well, you know, you, you, you create more resistance, right? you, Because if somebody's going to tell me I'm wrong, then they say I'm going to want to prove that I'm right, you know, and that's just the way it's going to be. Then what doesn't need to get anywhere? Um, so your question about Jesus, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I don't. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you. Where is it going now? If we if we are just too strictly identifying that I am the way. Well, what what in what way is Jesus the way? In what way is Jesus the life? How is Jesus uh, the truth? You know, that's what counts. And and we tend to, so much to just put that in terms of. It's an individual human being, Jesus of Nazareth. You know, I would say, and again, I, I, find, I find it difficult to put this into words. Christ is bigger than Jesus. Now, even you, you find sometimes the term in Paul's letters, or at least the way of speaking, what Paul say, the cosmic Christ. Christ is is yes, we believe that Jesus is the personification of the Christ. But by saying that. You're saying that Christ is something bigger than Jesus. So, what is the truth? What is the way he preaches? The way of self-giving love. A God. You know? So, in that, if, if you look at the way, truth, and life, in what does it mean to say that Jesus is the truth? That he speaks of God as a merciful Father. That's the truth of Jesus. What does it mean to say that Jesus is the way? That his ministry is primarily to the outcasts of this world. To the poor. You know, to the, the prostitutes and the, the tax collectors, you know, accused of being a friend of tax collectors and prostitutes. That's the way of Jesus. That's the truth of Jesus. And that's the life that comes. So it, it's not to deny that uh, no one comes to the Father except through Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. But do you have to put the label Jesus of Nazareth necessarily? We do. You know, and, and we give thanks that. That, that has been given to us. I know a, a Catholic bishop, now a cardinal, who uh, uh, was a student of Islam, and uh, he says that's. I, I, he said I, I really admire Islam. It's, it, there's so much about it that is so good. But what I give thanks to God every day for is that I see the face of God in Jesus Christ. You know, in a way that uh, the Muslims don't. And yet, uh, if I can bring you to that text I put on the, separately, the spiritual last will and testament of... As you transition, thank you for that. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, Non-Christian, you share it. Okay. Um, in uh, 1996, I don't know, sorry, a little more specific detail, uh, in 1996, seven Trappists, Trappist monks, uh, an outgrowth of the Benedictines, uh, were abducted, and they were at a monastery in Algeria, were inducted by 
uh, Algeria was going through a civil war between moderate Muslims and very uh, Islamicist Muslims, I guess you would say. And that group kidnapped seven monks and eventually uh, delivered their heads to, uh, to the people of God. Nobody knows, even at this point, who killed them. It's possible they were killed by the Algerian army, working closely with the French government, or it's possible they were killed by the people who abducted them. Uh, the movie of Gotham then is the story of these monks. And it mainly concerns they're coming to a decision to remain in Algeria even though they knew their life were in danger. It's an incredible film. Um, but after he was killed, uh, he, uh, he had written this last will and testament uh, a couple of years before that. And he's already aware, as he says, if it should happen one day, and it could be today that I become a victim of the terrorism in Algeria. Okay. Um, go down to the last three paragraphs. That, that's where it comes. But uh, I would say this is, this is one of, it, it's already become a classic document of Christian spirituality. And I should also add that Don Christian Cherge, along with 18 other Catholics, who were uh, executed during that civil war in Algeria have been beatified. So in some way, I'm beginning to think of Christian de Cherge as the patron saint of interreligious dialogue and specifically Muslim Catholic dialogue. But look at those last three paragraphs. My death clearly will appear to justify those who hastily judge me naive or idealistic. Because he, was, he, he studied Islam at a center in Rome, a Catholic center in Rome. Um, when the movie has a wonderful uh, scene of him preparing his talks to the community. And he has the Bible open and the Quran open. And he keeps going back and forth between the two of them, you know, trying to have them speak to one another. But as he said, some people thought he was naive. You know, uh, people who believe that Muslim, by definition, means terrorist. You know, and don't realize that Islam has been hijacked by the uh, extremists within that tradition. Uh, they will judge me not even I did this. Let him tell us now what he thinks of it, you know, now that he's been killed. Um, but these must realize that my avid curiosity will then be satisfied. And to me, that word curiosity is perhaps one of the key words in interreligious relations. We need to be curious about what other people are believing it, and find out why. You know, that, that, it's fascinating, but uh, we need to be curious. This is what I shall be able to do if God wills. And if God wills, of course, is the Arabic expression, inshallah. Uh, so he uses that. Immerse my gaze in that of the Father and contemplate with him his children of Islam just as he sees them all shining with the glory of Christ. The fruit of his passion and filled with the gift of the Spirit, whose secret joy will always be to establish communion and to refashion the likeness, playfully delighting in the differences. That's a beautiful expression, that God delights in the differences of the way we live our lives, you know? That God has been threatened by that. God delights in that, but he wants communion. He wants communion. He does, uh, I, I remember somebody, are you familiar with Thich Nhat Hanh? Is that any familiar? He was a Buddhist monk, died just a few years ago. Uh, very well known for his anti-war position in Vietnam. Uh, ex, you know, expulsed from the country for that. But somebody once said to him, because he, he wrote a book on Jesus, you know, his great love of Jesus, his respect for Jesus, and somebody said to him, uh, Master, uh, uh, you know, this, this, all you're talking about with this, you know, your respect for all different religions and different ways of expressing our faith, you know, what, what this is, is just becomes kind of a fruit salad. And Dick Nohan said, you know, I really like fruit salad. <laughs> <laughs> so... But again, that, that, 
taking it to one extreme. You know, it, it isn't meant to be just to you know, throw everything together. Respecting differences, but looking for communion between differences. Um, then he goes on. This life, totally mine and totally theirs, I thank God, who seems to have willed it entirely for the sake of that joy and in everything, enjoying everything and in spite of everything. Uh, then the last paragraph. And also you, the friend of my final moment, who would not be aware of what you are doing, the person who will kill you. Yes, I also say this thank you and this adieu to you, in whom I see the face of God. May we find each other happy, good thieves in paradise, if it pleases God, the Father of us both. Amen. In child. And the, the, the title of this last one, Justin, it's comes from Dieu sans visage. French means, this is a literal translation, when adieu, farewell, uh, takes on the face. But he's saying when to God. You know, is it visage? Is a, the original word in French, but it really means to take on a face. So he, he sees the face of God, even in the person who takes his life. And he speaks of the glory of Christ being manifested in the Jewish people. I remember our first meeting with the uh, Shia Muslims from Iran, which took place in Rome. We, we went down the hill across the Tiber from where we were meeting to the center of this uh, Pontifical Institute for the Study of Arabic and Islam. And I remember the, the leader of the Islamic, the, the Iranian is Muslims, said to the director of that institute, when your students leave this school, do they love Islam? And I thought, wow, I would always hear that. Time. He said, well, of course, of course. We teach them to love Islam. And, which is not to say that we teach them that Islam and Christianity are just the same. No, no. They're different. They're different. Go back again to that story that I told you about, you know, give up your ideas of God and then you will find God. We, we have different ways of naming God. But I can still remember a meeting that we had with these same Muslims. This one took place in Kenya. And the meeting was on God, one, and triune. We, we, we took up this issue as God, one, or three, you know. And <clears throat> after that meeting, the, the same person, Muhammad Ali Shomali, said, you know, I still don't think I can understand what you mean to say when you speak of Trinity. Because we, our understanding of God is so firmly and unequivocally monotheist. God is one. He said, but at least I'm beginning to see that you are also monotheists. Yeah. That three, when we speak of God in three, we have to, in some way, Really, we're not speaking about numbers. What we're speaking about is some kind of inner relationship. If God is love, there has to be some otherness. Love can't exist as, as a monad. You know, it's just, it is just that, that if God is love, well then there's, there's something that, and ultimately, I go back to what the Hamad Roshi said to me, give up your ideas about God, you know, uh, and let God be revealed to you. Yeah. And, and what, what the New Testament is saying, God is ultimately revealed as love in itself. Yeah. And the minute you say love, you're saying relationship. Yeah. Now, again, because of all sorts of Greek philosophy that entered into the question in the first centuries of the Christian movement, uh, they picked up on notions of person and nature and got that all put into a Greek philosophical model, which doesn't speak so easily to us today. You know? I think we, we more easily speak in, just in terms of relationship. You know, Uber, I, thou, those kinds of concepts. Um, so that would be there. Um,